Wow, thank you very much. Welcome. It, it's, it's an honor to be back here in Philadelphia and, and particularly uh, an honor to be here at the Free Library of Philadelphia. What a great institution this is. Um, I, I, uh, I understand that uh, the, the drone issue now has a, a very serious local connection here in Pennsylvania with the, the, uh, the decommissioned Willgrove Air Force Base is going to be converted into a drone uh, command and control center. And, you know, I, I know guys who are drone pilots. They get very offended when you say that they're unmanned aircraft. But uh, just so people understand, I'm sure many of you who have been working on this issue here locally know how this works. But you have uh, individuals who are in trailers or in command centers. Uh, you know, one of them is in, in the southwest of the United States. And they drive to work every day. And they get into the, into the box where they're operating these aircraft half a world away over the, uh, in the skies of Pakistan or Yemen. And, uh, and they engage in warfare, where they're playing what is essentially a video game in their trailer or their command center, uh, but the people that are being targeted on the ground are real people that are being uh, killed. And, and, and at this particular base where I know a drone pilot, he told me that when he, he gets into his car and he drives off the base after having been involved with operations, sometimes lethal, sometimes surveillance, and there's a sign when he's leaving that says, buckle up, this is the most dangerous part of your day meaning he has a greater likelihood of, of getting hit in a car accident than he does of being killed, even though he's involved with bombing other countries around the world. And, and drones have been a, uh, a central component of what the Obama administration calls its counterterrorism strategy. There's been a dramatic escalation of the use of drones to strike, uh, not just in Pakistan, but also in Yemen, occasionally in Somalia. Uh, the U.S. is, uh, under President Obama, very much building up its covert action capabilities on the African continent. Uh, in fact, when I was on the air, in the airport uh, on my way here, I, I ran into a, a young guy. And he said he was going for deployment. I said, where are you going? And he said, oh, I'm going to a, a place called Djibouti. And, and, and the U.S., of course, ha has taken over an old French military base there called Camp Lemonnier. And out of that base is the conventional U.S. military under the auspices of, of AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command. But there's also CIA paramilitaries and elite commandos from the Joint Special Operations Command that use it as a staging ground to run operations into Somalia and elsewhere. They train uh, forces from Ethiopia, Uganda, and Burundi. Uh, the U.S. is contemplating uh, building another drone base uh, around Mali, uh, where they're going to be targeting a group called Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, you also have uh, a, a base in Ethiopia and a relatively new base across uh, the water on the Arabian Peninsula in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and I think we're going to see an intensification of covert U.S. action, certainly in Africa, and we're, we've already seen it happen in Yemen. We're, we're living in a moment where we have a popular Democratic president who is a constitutional lawyer uh, by trade and training, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, and who campaigned on, a, on, on, on multiple pledges to reverse the excesses and abuses of the Bush era. Uh, said he was going to close Guantanamo, was going to end torture, was going to shut down the CIA so-called black sites around the world. But what's happened under this popular Democratic president who won the Nobel Peace Prize is that many of the most egregious aspects of the uh, apparatus that was built, by, built up by Bush and, and Cheney and their cohort uh, have been intensified or continued. Uh, some of them have been rebranded, and there's an attempt to legitimize policies that I think many liberals would have opposed if John McCain had won that election. But because it's President Obama, he's getting a free pass. You know, we don't, we don't have anything even vaguely resembling a credible challenge to these policies in the Congress, because the Democrats have, have checked their conscience at the door, and they're sitting out these two terms of Obama when it comes to asking key questions about how far we've come since 9-11. You know that in the, in the week after September 11th, in the week after those attacks, Congress passed a bill called the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, the AUMF. And basically what that did is it gave a blank check to the Bush administration to wage a global borderless war. And it authorized the U.S. to send forces in to any country uh, that it, it, it deemed had a connection to Al-Qaeda or the 9-11 atta attacks and that they could hunt down any individuals who were even tangentially connected to the 9-11 attacks. That is still the law that President Obama and his administration cite when they are bombing people in Yemen, 
in some cases targeting individuals who were toddlers on 9-11. The law was written to target the people responsible for 9-11. How was a toddler uh, responsible for 9-11? How are they still using that law? It was a blank check and it's still being used to this day. Now there's discussion about rewriting it to make it permanent. President Obama said in his second inauguration, his second inaugural address, that he didn't want the, the U.S. to live in a state of perpetual war, but his policies indicate that he wants the exact opposite. That, that, that's exactly what he wants. He wants the U.S. to be in a perpetual state of war. There was only one member of Congress that voted against the AUMF. I, imagine what that must have been like. We all remember what it was like in those days after 9-11, the fear and hysteria gripping the country. And, and, and it was this one member of Congress, Barbara Lee of California, and she stood up. And I, I, I think young people should, in particular, we, all of us, but young people in particular should watch that speech, and you can find it on, online, uh, because Barbara Lee was trembling when she gave that speech. Imagine the courage that that took to stand up. And what she said in her speech is, is that we, we cannot use these attacks to engage in retaliation across the globe and, and, and engage in actions that are going to undermine our democratic principles. And we cannot wage a war that doesn't have an end game. And you know what? Barbara Lee was right. She was so prophetic in her vision in the same way that Russ Feingold, when he was the lone senator to vote against the Patriot Act, saw something that, that so many of, of, of their colleagues on Capitol Hill either were too blind to notice or, or willfully chose to embrace uh, a rollback, a massive rollback of our civil liberties. You see, to, 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 to have the temerity or the courage to ask tough questions at a time when there's calls for mob violence. It takes real backbone. It takes real courage. And we're in one of those moments today where we have this popular Democratic president who won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's easy to oppose policies when you have cartoonish villains like Dick Cheney you know, in control, and who's, you know, the, the, I do actually imagine him in his lair plotting the destruction of the world for Halliburton stocks to go up, and uh, I'm only slightly kidding. But, but, but when, you, when you have the actual courage uh, to stand up and say that the same principles that applied when those guys were in power, when Bush and Cheney were in power, apply when President Obama is in power, that, that actually is where your principles are tested. And so we, we have an expansion of the drone strikes. We have the use of secret prisons uh, not being run by the CIA, but being run by other governments and their human rights abusing forces. And we're shipping prisoners off to be tortured in secret prisons in countries like Somalia, in the basement of, of its National Security Service. And I, I documented this when I traveled to Mogadishu. So, so here's change under President Obama. We close the CIA's black sites in Poland and Thailand, but then we start using Somalia's gulag, where we are uh, interrogating prisoners. We have CIA operatives and military intelligence interrogating prisoners, some of whom who have been snatched off the streets of third countries. In one case, I documented a, a young guy from Kenya who was snatched out of his home, taken to Wilson Airport, shackled and hooded, and then flown to Somalia, where he was put in this bedbug-infested underground prison with no access to light, no access to the outside world, no access to lawyers, and could not tell his family where he'd been taken. That action happened under President Obama. And when I called the U.S. government for comment, they said, yeah, that's, that sounds right. And they said, well, why, why, wouldn't we, why wouldn't we do that? It's natural that we would want to cooperate with the Somali and Kenyan authorities in the fight against terrorism. I think most Americans were under the impression when Obama issued the three executive orders that he did a couple of days into his administration that he was going to be dismantling it, not rebranding it and recasting it as a more legitimate form of running the same program. But that's largely what's happened. Renditions continue under President Obama. Assassination has been normalized as a central component, uh, not as though we haven't had that history before in this country, but it's been normalized by this president as a central component of what's called America's national security policy. I, I think that many liberals would have been up in arms if John McCain had tried to assert the right to kill American citizens without charging them with a crime when they're not on an active battlefield shooting against American soldiers. But when President Obama did it, uh, and there were three U.S. citizens killed in a two-week period in the fall of 2011, there were two responses in Washington, silence or enthusiastic support. Hillary Clinton sounded exactly like John McCain in her statements that she issued. Seventy percent, according to one poll a year and a half or so ago, 70 percent of self-identified liberals said that they support drone strikes. 
and that their support for those strikes dropped only negligibly when the target in question was an American citizen. You see, I, I think we're at a moment where we've crossed a line and it's going to be very, very difficult to, to roll it back, particularly when there's no credible opposition uh, or, or even credible questioners of the policy on Capitol Hill. We recently had uh, hearings, two sets of hearings, on, on drone strikes and targeted killing. And one of these hearings, there was a young Yemeni named Faraya al-Muslimi. I know this guy. I'd met him in, in Yemen. He's a very impressive young man. And he's invited to testify in front of the U.S. Senate. Six days before he came to the U.S. to testify, his family's village in Yemen had been bombed in a, in a drone strike. And, and, and he live tweeted the text messages that he was getting from his relatives who were, who were near the scene. And then he comes in front of the U.S. Congress. And we had this opportunity to have someone who could explain firsthand what the impact of those kinds of strikes uh, would be, not just for Yemen stability, but for our own. What, what, what happens to people when their family members get killed in a drone strike? When the intelligence turned out to be bad and, oops, we actually killed a group of teenagers because we had categorized them as military-aged males. And he gave a very eloquent statement in front of the U.S. Senate. And then for the next two hours, instead of asking him questions, relevant questions, Democratic and Republican senators alike asked three academics who were sitting next to him who could have walked to Congress any day of the week theoretical questions. They spent endless minutes discussing whether we should be referring to it as a drone or a UAV. And you've got a Yemeni whose village had just been bombed who could have answered many questions and told us a lot about the impact that the strikes are having. So I don't put all of this on President Obama. I put a lot of this also on Congress. The other thing is that there's a culture in Washington where when military figures or, or CIA officials go to Capitol Hill, Congress members want to know, are we winning? Which is such a false question. Are we winning? And then they, they wanted, they wanted to have metrics to define it. And so body count, that's become the, the, the way that we define victory. How many terrorists have we killed? You know, we're, we're, we're doing something in Yemen and Pakistan now called signature strikes. There are two kinds of, basic two kinds of drone strikes. One is a personality strike where you have a known individual and, and, and you've decided that you're going to take him out. So I'm in al-Zawahiri, you know, the, the nominal head of al-Qaeda now in the aftermath of bin Laden's demise. He's, he's a signature, he's a personality strike. If the U.S. finds him and they want to kill him, they take him out. Or Beitullah Massoud, who was one of the leaders of, uh, of the Pakistani Taliban, who was killed in the drone strike in 2009. But then we're also doing these things called signature strikes, which is that certain regions of Pakistan and Yemen have been determined to be hostile zones. And any military-aged males in those areas who have even a remote connection to someone that the U.S. Is, has flagged as a potential terrorist, maybe they went to the same mosque as them, maybe they delivered food to a certain house, maybe they were on a, a phone call with someone. If, if, that, if that individual is in a group of other military-aged males, U.S. policy is to assume that they are terrorists and preemptively kill them. It's like some grotesque form of pre-crime, like the movie Minority Report. We are killing people intentionally. This is important to, to, to listen to each detail of this. We are killing people intentionally whose identities we do not know and against whom we may not even possess intelligence that they're involved with criminal or terrorist plots. Think, think about what that means. It's, that's murder. That is murder. When you are saying we're going to just say that this group of young men, because of their age and where they live and because somebody had been on the phone with somebody that we think is a terrorist, that we're going to just say that they are terrorists and kill them. You know, I, I, I've been on the ground examining the aftermaths of these strikes, not just the drone strikes, but the cruise missile strikes and the night raids done by special operations forces. And I, I've come to the firm belief that, that the United States is now creating more new enemies than it is killing actual terrorists or people that are plotting against the United States. There will be blowback for these policies. There will be blowback. And, and, and you know what? We're giving people a legitimate reason to want to attack the United States, to avenge the deaths of their loved ones or the destructions of their livelihoods. And that's a sobering thing to say as an American or to realize about your own country and to realize it because, you know, after I, I heard for the 15th or 20th time someone in a different country, I heard it in Yemen, I heard it in Afghanistan, I heard it in Somalia, someone say to me, I used to think very differently about the United States, but I, I see you as the terrorist now. None of us love Al-Qaeda. No, none of us want them in our territory. But you know what we want less than Al-Qaeda? You and your drones. And we're encouraging people to adopt the mentality of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And we ignore the impact of our policy at our own peril. You know, I think it's shameful that in our society, the only people that really have to pay attention 
to what's going on abroad in these wars are military families who have loved ones deployed in these war zones. They, they, they think about it every single day. They worry that, that, that their son or their daughter is going to come back in a, in a body bag, and they pay attention. But many people in this country just go about their business. You know, the real housewives of, of, of New York and, and whatever Pinot Grigio they're drinking, that's reality television. And then the real widows of Baghdad are, are an afterthought, if they're even mentioned at all in the newspapers. We, we, we destroyed Iraq. We, we created a reality where suicide bombings are a normal part of daily life in Iraq. We built the largest embassy in the history of civilization there. You know, it's, 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 it's this massive colonial fortress. The CIA is once again ratcheting up its activities inside of Iraq. Special operations teams are returning to Iraq. That war has not ended. Except now we have, we have the, the, the added reality that there is sectarian violence, there's a constant state of civil war, and then you have the U.S. doing hunting operations inside the country. In Afghanistan, as we draw down the conventional troop presence, you're going to see an intensification of the operations of special ops teams that are going to continue to kill their way down the list. We don't even know who we're killing anymore. In Afghanistan, we've killed so many senior commanders of the Taliban that I wonder how that organization still exists if you, if the, you were to believe the U.S. press releases. I don't know how many times we've killed the number three man in big Al-Qaeda. I know that Syed al-Shiri, the number two guy in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, has been killed 11 times this year. He was killed a couple of weeks ago right before he issued an audio tape uh, referencing current events. So you know, when you don't know who you're killing, and, and then you're so far down your kill list that the people that you're targeting are like local farmers who've organized a, an uprising against you because you happen to be in their valley, it's time to really rethink what you're doing remaining in these countries. So, so it's not that President Obama is somehow a more militaristic president than George Bush. Bush and, and Cheney were engaged in Murder, Inc. Let's be very clear about it. They were doing unlawful, unconscionable actions every moment of their time in office. But that's the easy one to oppose. What, what is it that President Obama is doing? He is a hawkish Democrat who has doubled down on a lot of those policies. And the thing that's most damaging about it, the thing that's most damaging about it is that it actually seemed to have st seems to have stuck as a good idea in the minds of many liberals. I think people will look back five or ten years from now and ask how were we so silent in the face of a legitimization of policies we opposed when the Republicans were doing them a few years earlier. For me, we crossed a serious line uh, on September 30th, 2011, with, with, where, with how far we've come since the 9-11 attacks, when President Obama was faced with a decision uh, of whether or not to execute a U.S. citizen who had not been charged with a crime and against whom no public evidence had been presented. And this individual was a man named Anwar Awlaki, who was a U.S. citizen born in Las Cruces, New Mexico in 1971. And Obama... Uh, had decided that he wanted him taken out, and it was only a matter of choosing the, the time of day. And, and he didn't waver in his decision. He served as the prosecutor. Uh, the, the trial happened through leaks in the media, never in a courtroom. He served as prosecutor, judge, jury, and then executioner uh, of not just Anwar al but the other American citizen who was with him, a young man named Samir Khan. Now, I don't have any love for Anwar al -Laki. I think Anwar al said things I found to be reprehensible. He called for the assassination of a cartoonist in Seattle, Washington named Molly Norris who had drawn a demeaning picture of the Prophet Muhammad. But he printed an article saying someone should go and kill her. She had to go underground, change her name. You know, he praised the, the massacre at Fort Hood, Texas when Nadal Hassan shot up more than a dozen of his fellow soldiers and wounded scores of others and was paralyzed himself. And he said Nadal Hassan was a hero and called on other Muslims in the U.S. military to engage in similar actions. Uh, and he had met with the underwear bomber, uh, this, this young, deranged Nigerian kid, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, who tried to set his underpants on fire in a plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009. I'm willing, even for the sake of argument, to concede that everything, that every wild allegation made by anonymous officials in the press is true about Anwar al -Laki. 
Uh, I don't think it's true. But I'm willing to concede that for the sake of argument to, to make this point. It's not about who Anwar al was or what he did. It's about who are we as a society. Because we're, we, we are not judged. No society is judged by how you treat the popular and the powerful in your society or law-abiding citizens. You're judged by how you treat the least of your citizens, the poorest, and the most reprehensible. That's what tests how strong your judicial system is. That's what tests your values. So the story of what happened to Anwar al is very much a story of what's happening to us. But I want to tell you a little bit about his story because I think it speaks to, to where we are. As I said, he was born in, in New Mexico. I remember uh, uh, seeing him on television soon after 9-11. In fact, I tried to book him. I was a producer at the time for Amy Goodman's show, Democracy Now!, and I remember trying to book him on that show because he was speaking in a way that I think he was, his voice was such an important part of the dialogue that was happening in our country. On the one hand, as a, as a religious leader in the Muslim community, he was condemning the 9-11 attacks. He said that al-Qaeda had perverted the religion of Islam, and he even said that the United States had a right to go into Afghanistan to bring the perpetrators of 9-11 to justice. But he also was decrying and denouncing the hate attacks against Muslims and the attacks on Muslim businesses and taxi drivers and, and the rounding up of, of Muslims for questioning and the opening of the Guantanamo uh, prison in Cuba. And he was sort of a media celebrity helping big corporate media outlets, the Washington Post, New York Times. Uh, he was on Talk of the Nation on NPR, and he was on NewsHour with Jim Lehrer as a sort of expert. In fact, he was, so, he was so accepted as a part of that discussion in the U.S. at the time that he was invited by the Pentagon to give a lecture inside the Pentagon at a luncheon about uh, the state of Islam in the world. And just to give you a sense of how bad the intelligence was at the time in the Pentagon, among the sandwiches they served was one that had bacon on it. You invite an imam to come to the Pentagon and then you serve a bacon sandwich at his speech. Uh, no wonder the WMD thing went so swimmingly. So al though, was a guy who uh, didn't come from a, a radical family. His father, I know his, his parents are upstanding, amazing people, uh, and still are. His, his dad is one of the most respected academics um, in Yemen. He had come to the United States on a Fulbright scholarship, created the Department of Ag Agricultural Engineering with USAID and American officials uh, in Yemen, and has spent his life trying to solve the water crisis in that country. They didn't raise Anwar al to be the guy that you saw in the YouTube videos wearing the camouflage jacket and calling for jihad against the armed jihad against the United States. But he was a guy who was radicalized by the U.S. wars, abroad and at home. And eventually he leaves the United States and he spends some time in Britain and then he goes to Yemen, which is his family's ancestral homeland, and he starts recording sermons uh, and, uh, on CDs and, uh, and audio tapes. And his sermons become very popular in the English-speaking diaspora around the world. And then they start to pop up in terror investigations. And the U.S. starts to become concerned that Anwar al laki that his speeches are going to incite young Muslims to commit acts of terrorism in Western countries, in Britain or Canada, the United States, or elsewhere in, in Europe. And, and, and so the United States colludes with the Yemeni regime to arrest Anwar al laki in 2006 in Yemen uh, on trumped-up charges that he had intervened in a tribal dispute. And so he's put in prison for 18 months. And he spends, eight, of those 18 months, 17 in solitary confinement. And, I, I, and the, UN, the United Nations investigated his imprisonment and said it was extra-legal and that it was clear that the United States had played a role in his imprisonment. Uh, from my reporting, I learned that it was John Negroponte who at the time was the director of national intelligence and knows a lot about dirty wars from his time in Central America in the 80s where he was a major player in fueling the Contra War in Nicaragua and Battalion 316 in Honduras. But Negroponte had a meeting in Washington when al was in prison with, the, with a senior Yemeni official who was pressing the U.S. to agree to allow al to be released because it was becoming such a problem uh, for them. And, and, and so Negroponte tells this Yemeni official that the U.S. wants al kept in prison for four uh, or five years so that people forget about him. And that's, that's why he remained in prison. He comes out of jail a totally changed man. And he, is, he, he starts a blog called Imam Anwar's blog and begins uh, taking on discussions about if suicide bombing is acceptable under the teachings of the Quran. And, 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 and the U.S. is putting pressure on Yemen to re-arrest him. And eventually al goes underground. And the head of Yemen's intelligence service comes to his father and says, in May of 2009, if you don't get your son to come back into our prison, the Americans are going to kill him in a drone strike. This is before the underwear bomber, before Fort Hood, before anyone alleges al was involved with anything. They told his family, 
if you don't get him back in prison where he's not charged with any real crime, we, the Americans are going to kill him on a drone strike. So Al-Laki's father goes and finds him and he says, tells him this. And Al-Laki says, what are you, an American agent? You're working for them now? I was born free, I'll die free. I'm not going to let the Americans tell me which way to position my head. So he leaves his family, his three children and his wife, with his parents and, and he goes on the run. And, and the U.S. tried to kill him uh, more than a dozen times uh, by my count. In one of the early times that the, the U.S. bombed Yemen, in fact, the first time that President Obama authorized a strike on Yemen, they hit a Bedouin village based on bad intelligence that they had a senior al-Qaeda figure, and they killed 14 women and 21 children. And it wasn't a drone strike, it was a cruise missile attack. And they used cluster bombs, which are like flying landmines. And this village is called Al-Majla. And when, when, when we were in Abiyan province, where Al-Majla was, we had the missile parts videotaped. And you can see clearly they were manufactured by General Dynamics, and they say made in the United States. Uh, one of the cluster bombs uh, that was unexploded went off a couple days later and blew up more people. And, and, and the U.S. would have, would have uh, never taken credit for that strike, uh, but for a brave journalist in Yemen named Abdullah Haider Shia, who went to the scene and exposed that it was an American strike. He, he took pictures of the missile parts, he sent them to Amnesty International and other groups. They had them analyzed by munitions experts who said these are U.S. missiles, not U.S. missiles provided to another government. These are only owned by the United States. What had happened, though, in the aftermath of that strike is that the Yemeni government took responsibility and issued a press release saying that the Yemeni Air Force had attacked an al-Qaeda base and killed 34 terrorists. And then the U.S. Uh, sent congratulations to the Yemeni government. And we know now from the WikiLeaks cables that General David Petraeus, who at the time was the commander of CENTCOM, had gone to Yemen and, and hatched a conspiracy with the president of Yemen to start bombing that country and have the Yemeni government take responsibility for the strikes. At one point in one of the meetings, according to the WikiLeaks cables, the deputy prime minister of Yemen jokes with Petraeus, I just lied to the parliament and told them that it was our attack. And they laugh about it. And the president of Yemen says, you know, you can continue to bomb uh, and, as long as, as, uh, as we can say the bombs are ours and not yours. And so President Obama initiates this intense bombing campaign, at times cruise missiles, at times drone strikes, at times using special operations teams on the ground to unilaterally go and hunt people down. And one of their main targets was Anwar al -Laki. And so Osama bin Laden gets killed in May of 2011. And then the U.S. tried to run the deck and they start intensifying the drone strikes. And they very narrowly miss killing al and, uh, and then a few months later they find him at a location in northern Yemen where I started my story. And September 30th, 2011, they have this choice to make. They found al And while al is there, his son, who hasn't, his eldest son, Abdul Rahman, who hasn't seen him in years, is being raised as a normal teenager by his grandparents. They want, they're getting ready. They want to send him to the United States for college. He had just turned 16 years old. He's into hip hop, comic books, would go and hang out in Change Square during the Arab Spring when there was an uprising against their dictator. The kid turns 16 and decides that he wants to see his father, wants to find his father who he hasn't seen for years and feels that he's 16, he's, he's crossing a line in life. And so he sneaks into his mother's bedroom one morning and he goes into her purse and steals the equivalent of $40 in Yemeni rials. And he packs a small bag and he goes to the bus stop in Babel, Yemen, in the old city in Sana'a. And he takes a bus to Shebwa province, where their family's roots are. And, and the scene of repeated strikes attempts to kill his father. And he goes there to wait in hopes that his father will come and find him. And while he's there waiting, his father is killed. But he's killed in the north of Yemen, somewhere where the, the U.S. had never done a strike before. And, and, and it was sort of a surprise that al-Laki was there. So he gets killed. And after his killing, as I said, there was sort of celebration in Washington. Uh, one Republican congressman said about Samir Khan also being killed, if he wasn't also a target, then it was a bonus, it was a twofer. And th this, is, this is two U.S. citizens, neither of whom had been charged with a crime, being killed in an assassination, in a, in a direct hit. And, and you have met lawmakers celebrating it as this sort of triumph. The only people that said anything in Washington in opposition to this were the usual suspects, Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul. They were the only two people that said anything about it. So Al-Laki gets killed, and, and, and then his son is stuck in this village, and there's the uprising going on in the country, and the roads are blocked, and his, his grandparents are calling him and saying, your father's dead, it's over, you know, you have to come back. And that they were raising him. And he says, yeah, I'll come as soon as the road's clear, but I, I have to wait for that to happen. So he waits a couple of weeks, and then one night he's out having dinner with his 
cousin Ahmed who was 17 and, and, and some other young people from their tribe and they're sitting in an outdoor restaurant when a drone appears above them and fires a hellfire missile and blows the kids up. And, and the Obama administration has never ever explained why that kid was killed. Was he killed because his last name happened to be Awaki? Because no one's ever, ever provided any evidence that that kid had anything to do with terrorism. You know, if you look at his Facebook page and see what his interests were, right up to the moment that he died, this, this was a perfectly normal teenager who appeared to have nothing in common with his father. And, and, and this kid is killed with his teenage cousins. And they, they, after he's killed, they, a, a U.S. military official leaks to a major U.S. paper that he was 21 years old. Then the family produces his Colorado birth certificate showing he had just turned 16 years old. Then they say, well, he was at an Al-Qaeda meeting. And then they produce the list of the dead showing that he was with his cousins who were all teenagers in this outdoor restaurant. And they said, oh, well, he was meeting with Ibrahim Albana, who is a propagandist for al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Ibrahim Albana is still alive to this day. So who was the target in that strike? Why was this kid killed? When, when Harry Reid was on CNN, the majority leader, the senior Democrat in the Senate, when he was on CNN after these three American citizens were killed in a two-week period, in orders authorized by the Democratic Nobel Peace Prize winning constitutional law professor, President of the United States. He's on CNN and he's asked by Candy Crowley about the killing of these three American citizens. And he said, well, I'm not going to talk about classified intel, but I will say this. If there were three Americans that deserved to be killed, it, were, it was those three Americans. And so I, I went after Harry Reid's office and I was demanding that they explain wh wh what Abdul Rahman al Laki did. Why, why did he deserve to be killed, the 16-year-old kid? And then Robert Gibbs, who was the former White House press secretary, when he was serving as the senior uh, surrogate for Obama in the 2012 re-election campaign, he was the chief spokesperson for the campaign. He was asked by a young reporter, Sierra Abramson, uh, about the killing of Abdul Rahman al and she said, you know, he was killed with no due process. This was an American teenager. And he said he should have had a more responsible father. There, there are a few things I can think of that are, that are more shameful in life than blaming the killing of a child on, on who their parents are or, or who their father was. And, and Robert Gibbs should be ashamed of himself. He shouldn't be able to appear in public without someone asking that man why he made that statement. I met a, I, I don't hang out with powerful officials. I don't get invited to the White House Correspondents' Dinner to <laughs> laugh at the President's jokes about drones. The only time that he'll actually speak about it is when he's on John Stewart or Google Hangout or something. Um, and I don't get invited to the super soaker parties at Joe Biden's house with Chuck Todd and the boys. But, uh, but I happened to run into a former senior official recently and, uh, and I chased him across a parking lot. And uh, <laughs> true, true story. And, um, and was trying to ask him questions about this. It was someone who was deeply involved with the, kill, with the kill program and overseeing these things. And finally, he agreed to talk to me. He just said that, you know, and I usually don't make these agreements with powerful officials, but I really want to understand what happened here. He said, I'll talk to you if my name doesn't appear in your article. So I, okay, fine, I'll, I don't like making that agreement, but I will. So I can't tell you who this was, but it was a senior Obama administration official. And he told me that when President Obama was told that this kid was killed, that he was extremely upset and that he had been told, the president had been told by the CIA and the Joint Special Operations Command that, uh, that Ibrahim Albana, this guy I mentioned before, was alone and that that was the target. And, and, but what was more interesting is that John Brennan, who now is the CIA director, at the time was the senior advisor on homeland security and counterterrorism, that, that Brennan believed it was an intentional hit, that either JSAC or the CIA had intentionally killed that kid, perhaps based on false intelligence, and that he could, didn't believe it could possibly be a coincidence, that you kill the father and then two weeks later you kill the son. And so Brennan ordered a review. And I said to the official, well, so what happened with the review? He goes, I don't know, I never saw it. And I called the White House and National Security Council and they said they wouldn't comment to me on it and they wouldn't confirm or deny that there was any review done. And if there was a review done, they wouldn't share what the findings of the review were. But then the official assured me, no, 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 no. But, but listen, this is all a misunderstanding. I'm sure it was an outrageous mistake that the kid was collateral damage. And I said, well, if that's your assertion, and that's sort of what the dominant line that they've been leaking, that we, they didn't mean to kill the kid. Uh, why not say it then? Like, why not just come forward and say it? Because it, what it looks like, I think, to most people is that you, you, you killed the guy's kid because he was his kid. And, and, and I think it's hard to wrap our heads around how that could possibly be a coincidence. And he, he said, look at it this way. We had just killed three U.S. citizens in a two-week period, two of whom weren't even targets. It didn't look good. It was embarrassing. That's a direct quote. So the reason they won't explain why this kid was killed is because it would have been politically embarrassing for them. I mean, this, what, what planet are we living on right now? 
You know, I don't care if someone's an American or, or a Yemeni or a Pakistani. There should be no difference in our outrage when innocent people are killed. It doesn't matter what citizenship you possess. <laughs> but for me, the principle is this. If we're willing to do this to our own citizens, if we're willing to cross this line and deprive our own citizens of, their, of the most basic liberties, of the right to respond to your accusers, of, to see the evidence against you, to have a trial and be judged by a jury of your peers, if we're willing to snatch that away and say at times, well, for certain kinds of people, we agree that the mob can grab the pitchforks and, and, and the torches and go and deliver citizens justice, then we should stop saying that we're the shining city on the hill and that we're the example for everyone else to follow. We should say we're a country that at times wants, in fact, encourages mob violence or extrajudicial killings, because that's what this is. And if we do it to our own citizens, how, on, what are we going to treat? How are we going to treat Pakistanis or Yemenis or Somalis or Afghans or Mexicans? You know, th 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 these, these are serious questions that need to be asked of this administration. And the Democrats certainly aren't asking them. It's, it's been left to people like Rand Paul to ask the questions. I, I mean, I, my gosh, I can't, I, am, I have tried so hard to find something else I agree with Rand Paul on, and I can't find it. <laughs> but I, I think Rand Paul deserves credit for, for actually asking those questions that day on the Senate floor. I didn't do the whole I stand with Rand, because I don't stand with Rand. I actually kind of think that it's, it's, it's embarrassing that that's who asks these questions. And for a third of that day, for about third, you know, a third of that 12, 14 hour filibuster of John Brennan's nomination, some of the most sane discussion happened on the floor of the Senate where reporting of Glenn Greenwald and Spencer Ackerman and people was read into the congressional record. The name Abdurrahman Awlaki was said multiple times for the first time uh, you know, on C-SPAN and, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, in, on, the, on the floor of the U.S. Senate. And then the other two thirds of the day was, the, was a carnival of crazy. Just an absolute Michelle Bachman-inspired craziness with all theories about how Jane Fonda is going to be killed in a cafe in Berkeley in a drone strike for supporting the Viet Cong and you know, the Tea Party magazine offices are going to be bombed in Montana and just pure craziness. And I think part of what, what we're having, happening here is that you know, you've got on the right people that the, the scary black man president is going to come and drone strike us and that sort of motivates part of their fear of it. You know, Sarah Palin tweeting that she's against drone strikes. Yeah, if someone actually makes the horrid mistake of letting her into power one day, she will be a major lover of drones. It's just because they're Obama's drones. She's, if Obama loves drones, they hate drones. So, but but, but, but the, the point I'm making here is that we don't have serious people asking serious questions in Congress. So this stuff goes on unchallenged. And, and these guys are going to look back someday when they try to challenge this stuff, if, a, if, if Jeb Bush is president or Marco Rubio is president, the Republicans are going to have a field day with them. Where were you when your guy was doing it? See, I imagine Ch good old Cheney sitting there fly fishing somewhere, having a nice little chuckle about the Obama presidency and saying, thank God he cleaned it up for us because we're going to be able to continue it the next time that we come into office. I want to, uh, I want to wrap up so that we can have some discussion and, and questions and interaction here, but I, I want to end by saying that what, what, what I've seen in the course of my investigation around the world over these years is a, a, a hellscape where we have Somali warlords on our payroll that are being paid to hunt down people that may or may not be attached to some militant organization. We're increasing our use of drone strikes. We continue to work with mercenary companies under the Obama administration. You know, Blackwater's current iteration, Academy, it's called, it's not French, Academy. They, uh, you know, they've rebranded and they're still on the payroll and you've got all these renta armies that are still operating under President Obama. Backdoor use of secret prisons, continued use of rendition, Guantanamo remains open, hunger strikers being force-fed, men who've been cleared for release languishing in a prison that Obama pledged six years ago was going to be shut down in the first year of his administration. How, how much has actually changed when it comes to counterterrorism operations? How much has actually changed when it comes to the position of the U.S. in the world? You know, the U.S. engaged in regime change in Libya and opened the door uh, for radical groups that uh, I, I, I guarantee you someday are going to come back around to hit the United States. It's a total repeat of what happened in Afghanistan in the 80s where you have the short-sighted goal of unseating the Soviets and then you have the long-term consequence of acts of terrorism against you from the very people that you supported at a different point because it met your short-term strategic interests. Someone asked me the other day about Syria. Shouldn't the U.S. intervene to help in Syria? We are the least credible broker in the Middle East right now, second only probably to Israel. How are, how are we going to go and intervene in Syria when we have destroyed its neighbor, Iraq? We are helping along with the Saudis, the Iranians, the Qataris, and the Turks. We are fueling a sectarian war 
in Syria. We already have intervened. We've intervened on the side of instability in Syria. We're part of the problem in Syria right now. It's not that I think Bashar al-Assad is, is, a, is a brutal thug. And he was a brutal thug when he was a convenient ally of the United States when they were sending people like Maher Arar to be tortured in his torture chambers on behalf of the United States. He was a thug then, and he's a thug now. But so are these opposition groups that the U.S. and other countries are covertly supporting. So yeah, should we intervene? We're already intervened. We need to stop the destabilizing intervention we're already doing in the Middle East. The final thing I'll say is this, is that we, we watched, I think all of us watched, these school shootings with a sense of like utter horror. You know, I mean, I, I, I certainly did. The, you know, when the New York Times ran the, um, the list of the kids killed in the Newtown shooting, you know, and you see the ages, six, six, seven, six, six, seven. I mean, it just cr crushes you. It guts you as a person. And the, and the reason it does and the, is, is because journalists actually did their job and, and told us the stories of, of, of heroism of teachers who tried to save those kids' lives. You know, of, of, I mean, I, I, the story sticks with me of those three kids who were hiding in the closet. And I mean, all of us remember, I'm sure, some story from it. Or the Boston Marathon bombing, you know, watching Carlos Arredondo, who lost his son in, in Iraq. You know, he runs toward the blast, and there's that iconic picture of him. If you don't know his name, I guarantee you you've seen his face. He had the cowboy hat on, and he was carrying the double amputee. And, you know, and he, had, he had tied a, a cloth around his leg to try to stop the, the, the bleeding. And the, the adorable eight-year-old kid and the picture that, that went viral on Facebook that he had drawn, you know, a short time before he was killed that day, you know, calling for peace. And there was a graduate student that was killed in the Boston Marathon bombing and then another one who was from China. And, and recently when I was in Boston, I was with a friend who's Chinese and she was telling me that, uh, she said, you know, that President Obama name said that woman's name and it was a big story in China. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yeah. And there was a blog post that went viral in China. And the title of the blog post was Where You Die Matters. And the point of it, the point of it was that the most powerful man in the world never would have mentioned that woman's name if she had died in a factory explosion making a product for American consumers. She, her name was mentioned. Her death mattered and her life now matters because we know who she was b because of where she died. And, and, but I think there are lessons to be, to be drawn from, from this. If, 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 if we as journalists did our job, and, and stopped referring to people as collateral damage or casualties. And, and, and we actually knew the stories of, 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 of the, the little girls in Al-Majula whose families were wiped out when President Obama authorized a cruise missile attack on their village. If we knew, the, if we saw their artwork that they had done before, before their parents were taken away from them, or, or, if, or if we knew the, the stories of families that have been destroyed in, in, in our drone strikes, livelihoods wipe, wiped out, then it's harder to sort of dehumanize the other and say, oh, well, there's only a few civilians being killed, or these are, these are surgical, this is a cleaner way of waging war. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, we can be an incredibly empathetic society as Americans, and we, we show our best side in crisis, and it's true, it really is true. In those school shootings, it's, there is a sense of community. We walk around and we, we all are sharing a common experience because we consider it our own. But we, we, we have a moral obligation as residents or citizens of the most powerful nation on earth to, to own some part of what happens on the other side of, the, of our missiles because it's being done in our names, it's being done with our money, and it's ultimately going to affect our stability. So our challenge is actually quite a simple one, but it's a bold move to make in life. It's to have empathy for people who don't reside next door to us or don't appear on our newscast, to make it our business to know the name and story of one person who's lost something in this war, so that the next time someone tries to use the phrase collateral damage or casualties, you have a real story to tell them. And that's our challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. There are microphones here. Thank you. There are microphones here, and I think that the, the policy is if people just come up, or do, they, or do you want to bring, you're going to play Phil Donahue? Yeah. Okay, this, this young man over here. Yeah. If we could try to have some gender balance, too. A lot of men always raise their hand first. But. Okay. Uh, 30 seconds real quick. So over the past week, we've learned that two news networks have succumbed to mounting pressures 
uh, that are politically powerful and financially wealthy. Al Jazeera took down an op-ed uh, written by a professor who writes frequently about Israeli-Palestinian issues and PBS or a PBS affiliate reneged on a decision to air a documentary that was critical of the Koch brothers. And while media companies bowing to political pressures isn't necessarily new news, what concerns me about these cases is that these are networks that have traditionally been thought of as independent and fearless in the coverage that they provide. And if these pr pressures are mounting against them, are they also mounting against journalists who are truly independent in every sense of the word? Uh, journalists such as yourself, Glenn Greenwald, and Amy Goodman. And if so, uh, what have you done, uh, or what can we do to help you maintain your independence? Mm. Because the work that you do is truly is a gem, and we should help you. Yeah, thank you for raising that. I mean, I, um, I think that the, the White House and the Justice Department war on journalism, which is really what it is, um, is reprehensible. Um, I think that the targeting of the Associated Press and, uh, and the seizure of their phone records. They did a wide sweep against them. They're trying to say that it's about one story that they did about divulging uh, classified information about a, uh, an alleged underwear bomb plot in Yemen uh, a year or so ago. Uh, it, it actually was a, a part of a much larger hunt against the Associated Press. They've done some of the best reporting on the CIA and the, and the widening covert wars. Uh, Adam Goldman and Matt Apuzo and Kim Dozier, the, the reporters that are covering this, the Associated Press, are top-notch reporters. These are reporters for corporate uh, news outlet, but they are top-notch, or uh, a major powerful news outlet, and they are top-notch reporters, and I think that they uh, were targeted because they were getting too close to stories that the White House did not want out in the public domain, and what they were doing was what journalists are supposed to be doing, that when you have official leaks, you know, there's WikiLeaks and then there's White House leaks, and White House leaks is, is what they want you to be told uh, because it fits their political agenda, and, you know, John Brennan is a major leaker. He's responsible for so much BS that was floated after the bin Laden raid. He had to retract almost everything that man said because it was false. But journalists are taken for a ride every day by this White House. And those that are independent and ask questions, their emails are being intercepted. Their, uh, their Internet service providers are being served with national security letters. Their phone records are being seized. You know, I don't have any love in my heart for Fox News, but what they did to this reporter, uh, you know, James Rosen, is shameful, where they tried to criminalize the process of being an actual reporter. This has sent a chill through the journalism community and the relatively small world of reporters that cover these national security uh, uh, issues. I, it used to be the case that I would use encrypted email and, and OTR software, off-the-record software, to have encrypted chats with sources. No one will touch it anymore. They say, I'm talking about sources within government. Encryption's already been broken. Not safe. I won't do it. You ba we basically have to be Luddites now in order to communicate with our sources because no one wants to leave a digital footprint. No one wants to communicate in, in that way. It used to be that they would have someone break into the offices of a, of a reporter. Um, now it's that they just, they, they'll hack your email or they'll, they'll, get a, they'll get a warrant and they'll go and take it and you may or may not find out years later. When you take that and combine it with the war on whistleblowers, uh, you know, people like Thomas Drake, who was an NSA official who blew the whistle on criminality during the Bush era, the Obama Justice Department went after him and, 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 tried, and ruined his career. That man works at an Apple store right now. He, he used to be one of the top people at the NSA working on sensitive programs. He's now working at an Apple store. And there's nothing wrong with someone working at an Apple store to make a living, but this man had his career ruined because he stood up and blew the whistle and provided information to the press that he believed the American people had a right to know because he thought that it was criminal. When you, when you take the war on journalism and the war on whistleblowers and you put it together and you look at how John Kiriakou, the former CIA uh, uh, operative, is in prison right now, in part for blowing the whistle on torture, while Jose Rodriguez, who was one of the architects of the torture program, is on a book tour, that says a lot about where, where we are in this country, this look forward, not backwards stuff. I'm going to try that the next time you get stopped for speeding. Oh, officer, I'll just look forward and not backward to where I came from. <laughs> but it's, it's chilling what you're saying, and I think there's self-censorship that goes on. And in the case of the Koch brothers, I mean, money talks. I mean, those, they, they, are, they are an incredibly powerful, nefarious force in our society right now, involved with all sorts of badness. I mean, it's, it, I don't know how else to put it with the Koch brothers. They're tentacles that reach into almost every anti-democratic plot going on in this country. Is there, yeah. Is there, yeah, is, well, yeah just, uh, if we can get it to, to a young woman. For, yeah. Okay. I mean, just, or, or not, it doesn't have to be young. It could be any woman. I'm just saying it's a... <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. You can call me young. It's all right. It's all right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you qualify. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not be trying to be ageist here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question was, as I'm listening to your talk, and I listen to everything that you're talking about and everything that we've seen happen with our constitutionally trained, constitutional lawyer president continuing these terrible 
Bush policy. I got that from a Wu-Tang song. Well done. No, no, I'm just <laughs> um, It's very easy to be filled with a sense of despair because, I mean, our political leaders, our political leadership in this country is entirely bought and sold. The military-industrial complex is completely off the rails. And we have a populace that just happily handed over our civil rights with the Patriot Act, starting there and continuing. And so my question to you is, in your work and in your research, have you been able to draw any conclusions about, I mean, are there any points of vulnerability left in this, this, this system, this machine, where right. it can be attacked? Because I don't feel like we can go to our legislators and argue for change anymore. Or mm. I'm curious to hear what you think yeah, those, I get, I get those your... soft points are. Look, I, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, uh, I don't think anything will ever fundamentally change in our society unless we confront and expel corporations from the electoral process, uh, from, from <laughs> dominating. You know, members of Congress serve two-year terms. They, they probably spend 18 to 20 months of those two-year terms uh, raising funds. And, and, and who are the biggest donors? You know, if you, if you, if you look, it's sort of a remarkable study. When you look at the, the way the defense industry spends its dollars, I bet a lot of people just assume they give most of their money to Republicans. No, 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 no. When the winds are blowing the Democratic direction, then they give more money to the Democrats than they do to the Republicans. And so you have a situation where, I mean, it, it is, they, they literally are bought. Um, you know, I, I, had a, I, I was talking to a friend from a different country recently, and we, we were at a gathering with Nancy Pelosi. And this friend's from, I'm not going to say who he is because of what, what I'm going to tell you next, but he said to me, you know, I want Nancy Pelosi to see your movie. I'm like, Nancy Pelosi's not going to see our movie. And he goes, well, what if we raised $100,000 and paid her to watch the movie? <laughs> And he goes, we could do that in my country. We could figure out a way to get the president to go and do that. And I said, oh, you know, you're, you know see, the corruption here is actually formalized. You know, it's, a, it's, it's like we could, just, we could give it to her campaign. We can't actually pay her, but we could. So we could actually do that. Because in thinking about it, yeah, I probably could give $100,000 to Nancy Pelosi to watch the movie. I would just have to donate it to her PAC or something. Um, but, but that's the point. That's how our system is set up. And so when you have politicians... That, uh, that can get, get bankrolled by huge defense contractors or big oil or big energy, uh, what incentive do they have to have a conscience on those issues? They're no longer representing their constituents, they're representing their paymasters. And so, you know, the best chance we had to even start to chisel away at this was McCain-Feingold, you know, the, the legislation on campaign finance reform. And it wasn't perfect, but it would have been a step toward it. When Obama opted out of, the, of, of public funding, and went nuclear with the private cash, it basically destroyed it. And, and then McCain was forced to, uh, to, to then go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the private money fundraising uh, against Obama. And that pretty much crushed it. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that some segment of our society has to make it their business to try to change that aspect of how politics are done, because all the rest of it is just sort of speeches that we're giving and pressure, because writing letters to members of Congress on these issues seldom tilts them in any way. It's money that talks, and, and, and money runs the system, and so it is a bleak outlook, and I don't, I don't mean to like be passing out razor blades, but I do think that it's, it is, is a bleak situation. Yeah, we'll just switch back and forth. Let me can... Yeah, go ahead, whichever. Um, you talked about the uh, military drones, but there's also legal drones being used against uh, Muslim men in this country, uh, like the Fort Dix Five, uh, which is probably one of the most egregious cases of these 500 uh, Muslim men in prison now, where they use uh, undercover uh, agent provocateurs, um, they use a lot of uh, legal or, uh, under, or um, secret testimony, uh, and these are kangaroo courts here in the United States. Uh, in New Jersey, it was the uh, person who's now governor of New Jersey, who was the district attorney that prosecuted the Fort Dix Five. Uh, there's been many articles written about how all these cases are unjust, and they hearken back to the jailing, uh, imprisoning of the Japanese uh, during World War II. Is there a question that you're getting to? Yes. I mean, I'm familiar with all those cases, but... Yes, is there, yeah, uh, don't you think that that's also unjust, as, as unjust as using drones overseas 
It's also unjust hearing the United yeah, States I mean, this, what look, they're the, doing to the, the, F, the FBI has shown very adept at breaking up its own terror plots. Um, I mean, it's happened repeatedly. It's uh, no, but I'm, I'm 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 saying that seriously. I mean, there's there's a pattern here where. You know, and, and, and sometimes it t they target mentally really unstable uh, individuals and they tap into uh, that instability. And, um, and, and there's a number of cases where the individuals who, are, who go to prison for a long time actually are, 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 are people who have serious mental challenges. And, um, and the FBI will infiltrate. And, they, and in some of these cases, they actually seem to be the ones encouraging them to you know, plot an actual bomb attack. Maybe it was people who were contemplating some action or that they were becoming radicalized, and then you have an FBI informant who pops onto the scene, and next thing you know, they have an actual plot underway, and and they are they're setting people up, um, and part of it is you know they're, 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 we're creating this climate of fear. There's a demand for results, but absolutely, what's happening at home is deeply connected to what's going on abroad, and and uh, there have been so many Muslims that have been railroaded in this country, um, and demonized, and and set up. Uh, it's not that there aren't active terror plots; there are. Um, and, I, and I hope we do bust them up, but we shouldn't be breaking up our own terror plots. I mean, that says something really dark about, about what's going on with law enforcement. And I also, it tangentially relates to what you're saying. I'm very concerned about the paramilitarization of law enforcement in the U.S. It's a serious concern where you, you have, uh, you know, there's, part of the issue is about domestic use of drones, and in a number of municipalities there are citizens that are, getting together and trying to ban the use of drones. But it, it's, it's much deeper than that. Uh, it's, it's, we have, police are becoming paramilitary forces. And you have this sort of, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are coming home, and you, the, you know, everything is sort of moving toward SWAT-style tactics. I mean, look at, you know, in, in Boston, and when they were hunting down this, uh, this cop, uh, Dortner, out in, uh, in Los Angeles, I mean, this looks like special operations raids that are, are happening. And, you know, certainly in poor communities and communities of color across this country, People have been facing this reality for, for years and years, where urban areas in the United States are effectively war zones and night raids are a part of daily life, just as they are in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And, and you know, we, when you combine that with the privatization of certain law enforcement functions and a paramilitarization of the U.S.-Mexico border, every, we're doing everything is, is, is being militarized. This Sarnayev kid in Boston, you know, who, who's in custody in connection with the marathon bombing, some of the Republicans wanted him treated as an enemy combatant. They want him sent to Guantanamo, despite the fact that he's a U.S. citizen. There's this, this knee-jerk military reaction to things, uh, to, to crises, and, and, and that's something we really have to confront in our society, but it's, it's, it, it really threatens our democratic existence, I think, when everything becomes a paramilitary solution. It's, it's a very, very serious problem. Yeah. Then we we'll go to the other side. Yeah. You, just, you pick someone, because I can't see with the light. So. But we should also make sure make an effort to get back to the back, too. Uh, thank you, Mr. Skeho, for speaking today. I was wondering, um, I heard a report this morning that the CIA um, has said, it, at least says it's going to transfer its drone program to the Pentagon. Yeah. I heard that on Democracy Now! this morning. And I was wondering that the lack of a public explanation, which Obama says he will give, about the drone program, whether to what extent that's covering up internecine struggles and turf wars with, between the CIA and the Pentagon, for, for instance, in the White House, hmm. and to what extent it's just, I think as other questions have said, a war machine that no longer considers itself to be bound by, even vaguely, by the rule of law. So, thank right. you. so what you're referring to, and this has been talked about for some time, it's sort of, I mean, really, in reality, what I think is that this is sort of a dog and pony show, that John Brennan, you know, they talk about John Brennan like he's a priest, you know, they compare, he's like St. Augustine, and he's just toiling over, I mean, this, if you could go and look into this later, it's incredible, like, they're, all these articles talking about how he and Obama are basically like these, these monks, you know, running the drone program, and, uh, and Brennan, you know, and so Brennan, you know, part of the sort of dog and pony show is Brennan, of course, Brennan couldn't become CIA director when Obama first tried to nominate him because Democrats actually stood up and said, we don't want a guy who prays torture to be Obama's director of CIA. And then years later, it's just Rand Paul and the crazy parade uh, opposing him, which shows you how far we've come. And then uh, Brennan's saying, well, we're going to move the drone program over to the military because there's greater transparency. The, the whole thing, first of all, the military has been running a parallel drone program for the duration of the, you know, what's been called the War on Terror. In Pakistan, JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, operates drones. In Yemen, they already operate drones. So it's, it's, it's intended to sort of give the perception that something is being done, that they're listening to the public. Um, but in reality, it's, it's, it's going to continue business as usual. 
You know, uh, some people are under the misperception that the military cannot do a covert action, that it's only the CIA. JSOC does covert actions every day um, around the globe. So, you know, I'm not saying that, that it's, it's, it's not quite that it's, that makes, you know, no difference whatsoever. I actually think it could make it worse, have less oversight. You know, the, there, are, there are some actual tough questioners on the Intelligence Committee in the House. The Senate Armed Services Committee on these issues has largely been a rubber stamp operation for these covert actions. So, you know, I think, I think, I think really it's kind of propaganda. It's meant to make it look like something's happening when in reality it's just a, you know, old wine in a new bottle. Yeah, in the back. Hi, Dustin. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for coming. Um, I, uh, I, I really respect you a lot. Um, I've been listening to your work and, and reading your articles, but um, I, I wouldn't be doing my job as, as, a, as a human being if I didn't correct you on your word for we, because I certainly didn't bomb Anwar and uh, al -Awlaki. Um I didn't send any of these drones over to Pakistan, so respectfully, I'd like to correct you on that. So you're, you're a tax resistor? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly a, an aggressive military resistor. So. But you're, so you don't pay taxes? I'm working on it. Okay, right. but, but if you're going to confront me about my use of the word we, you know why I use, well, let me defend myself then. Why I use the word we is I think if we don't all realize that we're, if we're complicit in this, then, then we're, we're whistling past the graveyard. We are deeply complicit in this. I respect that. I respect that. But I, I, More I, importantly, I, I admire your spirit, man. I appreciate that. Good stuff. Um, what woke you up to this? Let's see. By the way, people see his T-shirt says "Not a terrorist." I'm glad you clarified that for the record. Um, now, can someone remove him for asking me a tough question? <laughs> I always love that when officials do that. When someone like disrupts their speech, then they say, "You know, what is the First Amendment great?" Now the exit's right there to throw him out. Um, look, I, I, you said what, what woke me up to this. I mean, you know, I. I um, uh, I remember hearing Amy Goodman on the radio for the first time, and I, I, I had wanted to be a teacher. Um, I was, that's what I was studying. I, I've never taken a journalism class in my life. And I heard Amy Goodman on the radio, and I said, I want to I do that. And uh, so I started stalking her, and, uh, <laughs> in a non-creepy way, you know. But I started writing her letters and, and asking if, I could, if she had a cat, I'll feed her cat or walk her dog or wash her windows. And she eventually had to like, decide whether to get a restraining order against me or like, let me come and volunteer. So I, I started off in radio and learned it like as a trade, as an apprentice, like the way a plumber or electrician. Um, and, uh, and, and my early work, what I started off doing, um, one, you know, one of the first trips I took was to Iraq in the 90s. I went in with this group called Voices in the Wilderness, which is now called Voices for Creative Nonviolence. And they were uh, symbolically breaking the sanctions on Iraq by bringing in medical supplies that had been banned by the U.S. Um, you know, from, from uh, bringing into Iraq. And, and it just, it opened my eyes. I couldn't believe w what was being done in our name. And I wasn't an investigative reporter at all. I was a kid with a, with a tape recorder. And what, much of what I did was just go and ask people to tell me their stories. And then I tried to edit it into cogent narratives so we could say, well, here's this person, uh, this, this mother who's in a hospital in Basra, and she's just given birth to a, a baby that has a gaping hole that stretches from the nose to the throat, and the doctors are saying that it's a result of the munitions that were used during the Gulf War that had depleted uranium in them. And so much of my early work as a journalist was about listening to people who lived on the other side of the barrel of the gun, and I, I, I never looked back. I said, that's what I wanted to do, and I felt like it was, it was, uh, it was, it was so important for people in this country to have, have names and faces on the other side of the, of the story. And, and that's what's driven me. I mean, and there's so many people that I think about every day that I've met along the way that humble me. And the, the journalist who I told you about that exposed that U.S. missile strike, Abdullah Lahaider Shia, he's in prison in Yemen right now, in part because President Obama is keeping them, him there. He was convicted on trumped-up charges of being a member of al-Qaeda in a court set up by the dictator of Yemen to prosecute journalists for crimes against the state. And, and, and when the president of Yemen was going to pardon him, uh, news leaked in the Yemeni media that this was going to happen. And President Obama that day called the dictator of Yemen. He personally called him and said that the U.S. wants him to remain in prison. And that journalist, he's been in prison for three years. And he, he was a well-known journalist who, worked, who did work for the Washington Post, ABC News, Al Jazeera, and, and was a fiercely independent guy who was very critical of al-Qaeda and did tough interviews with the leaders of al-Qaeda. He was a real journalist. He's in prison because of our constitutional law professor, president. And, you know, so you ask me why I do what I do. I mean, I, my, if you look at my book, my book is dedicated to journalists imprisoned for telling the truth and those who die in pursuit of the truth. And, and then the last line of my book is that Abdullah Haider Shia, this Yemeni journalist, should be set free. 
Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I try to do my work in the spirit of unfamous journalists who don't get invited to give speeches that are broadcast on C-SPAN or don't get to go on the Rachel Maddow show or whatever. That, those, are, those, are, those are my heroes, the people that keep me going. I have a quick question with probably a long answer. Um, can you tell us something about what your investigations have shown um, as to Israel's involvement in dirty wars, drone wars, um, either as a model or as, um, you know, a, a producer of drones and so on? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Israel was a trendsetter with this for the U.S. I mean, the, the you know, the Isra Israelis... Uh, the Israeli model, you know, with these, uh, these assassination ops um, really is what the U.S. based its program on. Um, and, you know, Israel and the United States are, are deep in bed together in all sorts of covert actions around the world. And, of course, the U.S., uh, you know, gives tremendous military support uh, to the Israelis. I would recommend that, uh, that people watch this film, if you haven't seen it, called The Gatekeepers which is uh, interviews with former heads of the Shin Bet. And I mean, it's, it's a flawed movie, but it's an important movie, and I think it's definitely worth seeing, where these guys describe sort of the, 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 the people that were running the kill program in Israel kind of describe how they saw it playing out and what the actual you know, end result of it has been. And there's some pretty sobering remarks that they make in that. But, um, you know, I mean, I Israel and the fact that it possesses hundreds of nuclear weapons uh, that, you know, no one's allowed to talk about, when, when, so, when, when a scientist, Mordecai Vanunu, blew the whistle on the nuclear program, they put him in prison and drove him insane. Uh, you know, and, and the United States won't ever talk about Israel's nuclear program. There's a reason why other countries in that region want nuclear weapons. It's as a deterrence against Israel. You know, it, and and, and I, I, I think if there's going to be an attack on Iran, it's going to be an Israeli-led attack. Um, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, of, of reason to suspect that Israel has been involved with the assassination of these Iranian nuclear scientists. Um, I don't know that anything has been definitively proven, um, but someone's certainly killing Iranian nuclear scientists, and, and, and Israel certainly has had, taken the most belligerent stance uh, toward Iran. So, you know, Israel is engaged in its own dirty wars. It doesn't even need the United States to tell it what to do. It certainly is deep into its own uh, actions. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Oh, let me just say, I'm happy to, when, uh, even if people don't want to buy a book, I'm, when I do the books, I'm happy to talk to people. If, you just have to get in line with everyone else, but I'd be happy to, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, to, to do it. So I don't, I don't know where my F Phil and Philippe, Philippe Donah Donahue are, but they can <laughs> get, yeah. Um, I, f I feel that the people that came here today are equally outraged by what you've reported, but I also sense that not many people are surprised because we've been inundated with reports of, as someone else, someone else mentioned earlier, um, the military industrial complex uh, abusing their powers and um, the extensions of that. So my question to you is, in looking on the legacy of Oliver Stone and other people before you who have tried to blow the whistle do you really feel that it's an issue of information that's not getting out? Or do we just need experts like you to actually run for political office to make change? <laughs> not, do you, I mean, do you think that... Not on your life, brother. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, no I, I, I appreciate the question. I'm not, I have way too many skeletons in my closet. They, no. Um, uh, no, I mean, look, I, 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 to take your question ser seriously, um, I... You know, I, I do think that unless we break the duopoly, um, you know, in, unless we have an actual multi-party system in this country, we're, we're not going to get anywhere with the Democratic and Republican parties. I mean, they, their, their agenda is to support big business um, and, and, if, and, and to keep sort of the, the, uh, the idea that America is the exception in the world. Um, that, that's a requirement to be president of the United States. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I think I, I really admire people, particularly on a local level, who try to organize third-party uh, challenges to Democrats and Republicans because I think it's it's the most democratic thing you could do is to try to fight actually to break the stranglehold that the two parties have, particularly when it comes to the national security state. You know, there are differences in domestic policy between Democrats and Republicans. When it comes to the national security state, they are, they're the war party, period. And, uh, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you raised it and maybe there's young people in this room that are going to try to run for those uh, offices and get involved at the school board level, the city council level, because I, I actually think it could, th that you can have change there. That and confronting corporate money, those aren't the issues that I cover, but those are the issues that I care about personally as someone in this country and in my personal life, those are issues that I work on, and along with trying to end the death penalty. So, 
Um, I thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for your question. Happy to answer questions. We'll go upstairs.